I burst into the studio telling Danny about this insane show that I saw on YouTube where these martial artists got locked into a cage with a guy with a fake knife and were trying to defend themselves. And all of them, bar one, who looks a little bit familiar, uh, got knifed to death and didn't survive. And it turns out that was the ultimate self-defense championships. And that is your show. So we've been very excited to talk to you because what an amazing idea that is, what an incredible show. And yeah, I mean, we've just had the pleasure of watching season two and having a preview. So thank you very much for that. But yeah, we want to talk to you about that show, where the idea came from, obviously talk about season two and compare the two. But yeah, I mean, let's start there. So tell us about what the Ultimate Self-Defense Championships is. Right. Uh, so before I go there, I just wanted to also put on record, uh, there's another significant person who's not here that I want to name is uh, Jeff Phillips. He is uh, my partner in season one and season two and making it happen. Uh, so it's not only me, <laughs> but yes, I'm, I'm one of the, the guys running it. Uh, but the Ultimate Cell Defense Championship is, I, I call it YouTube Reality Series, where we put six martial arts experts in various cell defense challenges to see who becomes the ultimate cell defense uh, champion. Uh, to say it more simply, it's uh, a number of different challenges which vary from more fighting skill based, uh, like fighting on the moving bus that happened in season one, uh, or going more to scenarios like cerebral uh, situational awareness, uh, cerebral decisions, understanding what's happening, uh, making the right decision, using de-escalation. So it's an attempt essentially to entertain people, of course. It's, 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 not, it's always interesting to watch something fun, and I think the, the show is very fun to watch. But at the same time, we want to make sure that it's... Uh, Jesse Ankamp, another uh, YouTuber friend of mine, he he's calls it edutainment, where it's a mix of <laughs> education and entertainment. So even like if the person doesn't even realize after watching the show, they they come out smarter. Uh, so hopefully that we're achieving that goal that uh, when you see these martial artists going through these challenges and making decisions, sometimes the right decisions, sometimes the wrong decisions, you ideally you learn from their mistakes and from uh, their good parts. And just a quick example before I go on a tangent. Uh, in season one, there's a moment where a knife attacker uh, tries to mug us as the contenders, as the contestants. And uh, some of the guys, including myself, were like, hey, take my wallet. And I wasn't even sure if this is going to fly, if this is going to work out. Uh, because I, as a participant slash director, I couldn't know all the details because it wouldn't be fair. So I was like, is this going to work? And it worked. It was like, fine, you can give your wallet. But there was Jeff Chan, uh, another YouTuber, <laughs> professional fighter. He, he just went straight into ass kicking. And then we told him like, hey, we gave the wallet. And he's like, God damn it. You could have done that. I never thought about it. Like. So, you know, it's... Uh, he's just I always think, ready to fight, though, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's... <laughs> he's it's, always it's ready life, to go. Like, right, right. So, so I think, like, lessons like that, like what Jeff Chan learned, other people are like, yeah, actually, you know, you can give your wallet. So, yeah, I think that's one of our aims for the show. Hey, guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. Yeah, I think you definitely achieved that. I, I definitely took stuff away from it. And it's, it's just, it's, it's such an interesting concept because, and I don't know if this is a play on the name, but of course, you know, 25 years ago, we had the Ultimate Fighting Championships. And that was to understand which martial art would be better fighting another martial art. And we, we kind of learned what we learned there. But, you know, moving forward now, we still have this argument, which is better for self-defense. You know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a prime example. It's obviously very good in combat against other martial arts, but in self-defense situations, is it effective? And like you've created in self-defense, you've got all these different scenarios to consider. Yeah. And, you know, outside of that, you've also got the combatives and, and the various other self-defense systems. And I think you had a chat, I see, I see Mike. Oh wait, uh, season one, I see Mike, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think going into the Shank Tank in particular, I think he, he boasted about having spent 70 odd hours of, yeah. you know, knife defense <laughs> yeah, <I> know. <laughs> going in. And, and it was fascinating to see actually even, 
you know, trained, trained self-defense martial artists to work against weapons, yeah. how poorly they fared in situations. So for me, that really did just compound my ideas around actually in against a, a weapon, you should probably just cut your right. losses and get yeah, out Yeah, that's, that's, that's one thing I took away from it. First of all, I was like, if anyone ever pulls a knife on me, I'm just going to try and get out of there or give them what they want because, you know, you in your head before that, I thought ah, maybe, you know, you grab his hand or you can wrestle him down or whatever. But like you said, they swap hands. <laughs> and they're just jabbing you then in the ribs. And it's, it's, you know, when people who are trained getting stabbed 40 or 50 times, you then really realize like, oh God, like, and that's with them still fighting back. Imagine if they're actually stabbed, then they get hurt and then they're just incapacitated after about four, you know, mm. and... Yeah, uh, I want to admit that I did icy Mike uh, dirty a little bit there uh, with the <laughs> editing because I I'm the guy who edits the the show too, and so you know I can make creative decisions and and the way I shape the story. There's there's reality which happened obviously which you work with and that's what you want to portray, but you know you can you can you can omit certain things, you can add certain things, and so with icy Mike he actually. Regarding that that moment when he says, I did 70 hours of, of knife defense, he actually said that after episode two, where he successfully defended against the knife attacker by <laughs> kicking the he, he kicked the knife out of the hand of the guy. Granted, the thing is, in episode two, the intensity of the knife attacker is very different. He's he's playing a drug addict coming to mug you. He's not sure if he wants to attack you, like he knows his role. That's his role. And if you offer him your wallet, he's going to be okay. Where the other episode, the shank tank, it's more like you're in prison and somebody, you know, is going to, they want a death sentence on you. Like they're going to go all out, which, you know, I'm not like we're going to be in prison, but these things can happen. And so Mike, he he's like, oh yeah, I did 70 hours of knife defense. And I, I'm just looking at the edit. I'm like, can I, can I do this? <laughs> can I use that <laughs> moment before he gets brutally stabbed? And I think it was still, and you know, he's a great sport. He never said anything wrong about it. I think we're we're an honest bunch. Uh, the the martial arts YouTubers, or I mean, the ones which participated. So I think he was okay with that. But at the same time, I also want to point out that we all got stabbed brutally, and Mike is also significantly smaller than the, the other guys, myself including him. I'm, I'm big compared to many people. So, so yeah, there's many things which need to be said, but I don't want to go too much there. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the other thing I quickly wanted to mention is uh, that was one of the goals definitely with the, we call the episode, the shank tank, the, the you're locked in a room with a knife attacker. Uh, there's so many knife defense videos where like, Oh, you do this fancy Kung Fu move and you kick the knife out and this and that, like apparently, you know, it's, it's possible, but, a lot of that those things are so unlikely but so many people like th those videos have millions of views and so we wanted to make sure that whoever watches the show they would see like knife defense is not a joke like you will probably and most good cell defense experts i spoke to they all admit knife is just like you're probably going to get screwed like your chances are not good and we sh we wanted to show that yeah, and I think the other thing as well, which is obviously so obvious, but you just don't think about it when defending against a knife attacker, is is you think about, I don't know, maybe getting two on one and controlling the arm. But you forget they can also punch, kick, headbutt you, bite you as well. And that's what I thought you did a really good job of, where obviously the attacker wasn't just stabbing, he was fighting with a knife and, and using everything he had available. And, and I think that made a real difference. Yeah. Yeah. I think again, there's, it's, it's, it's tough because self-defense is so varied. Like there's so many things, so many aspects, there's the psychological aspect, the environmental aspect. And we went, when we're designing the, the shank tank, we went for the route of, so this guy really wants to kill you. He doesn't give a crap about his own safety. Like he's going to go all out and he's, he's trained. He's done this before, which is like, it doesn't mean you're every knife attacker in the street who's going to attack you is going to be that guy. A lot of those guys are probably going to be, you know, they're, they're just going to show the knife to intimidate you and not even plan to use it. But also there are chances that you will meet the guy who stabbed dozens of people before and he's going to go all out. And so we wanted to make sure we go through the hard mode. Like this is what happens if somebody really wants to get you. And most likely you're not going to be able to do much. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And then um, obviously Danny mentioned a moment ago about, you know, his lesson from that is that it will just run from a knife. But of course you covered that as well. So <laughs> covered yeah. all bases. 
Yeah, I really, I like, I keep pushing that because it's so frustrating for me that that so many people, and I understand, like, it makes sense. Like, you see a knife, run away. It's like, yeah, of course, that's great. But then, first of all, the attacker may be more physically uh, capable than you. Like, and that, we show that in, in uh, season one, episode three, where you have to run away from knife attackers. And we had, uh, obviously, again, not every person that you meet in the street is going to be like that. But we had a former i believe professional um football uh rugby rugby <laughs> player so he's like you know his thighs are huge he's he's like well built and he's super athletic and he caught all of us like if we escaped the warehouse he still caught up and just stabbed us but again running away is not gonna always work and the other thing is what if you're with your wife what if you're with your child you're like gonna throw the child at it at the attacker and run away it's like people don't consider so many aspects they simplify things too much and self-defense is never simple so i try to push that every time but then still i get comments every day like oh you should just run away i'm like what why did i even like why am i even trying people are so <laughs> stuck. but i'm sure i'm sure not everyone's like that a lot of people are probably probably thought about it afterwards that running away is not always it's great but it's not always uh, the yeah. option i think it's it's one of many options isn't it depending on the situation right. and i think that's what yeah. the show gives you is there's certain scenarios where you can get away with certain stuff and there's certain scenarios where you just can't right yeah like uh, if if we're revealing some of the moments in uh, season two uh, i'm thinking about episode two which is the bar fights uh I, I i was happy that a lot of the contestants who went through that they they came to that conclusion that obviously de-escalation talking your way out of the situation not fighting is the best solution like most of the times it's just safe to do that but sometimes the other guy just wants to fight you like and that's that's the scenario that, which we looked at like you know they want to kick your ass and and for whatever reason and probably you're not going to be able to talk them out of it so i mean so yeah, especially when awesome. alcohol's involved, and you know, it, it only takes a little thing sometimes. I've been punched a few times <laughs> on a night out just for, for me being like, "Oh, it's alright," and then boom, like you hit, and then you're in a you're in a fight. And uh, yeah, I think you've done a really good job of actually creating a scenario which seemed kind of realistic, you know, with with regards to how it was going. Um, again, I don't want to talk too much about it, but like offering a drink and uh, certain scenarios. Are oh, you talking to my girlfriend? You know, the, all that sort of stuff actually happens. You know, yeah. and um, fascinated to to get your views on certain reactions of Craig. Um, I thought it was brilliant how he reacted. It was like he, you could tell compared to everyone else that he had been in that situation more times than the the martial artists who who have obviously probably not been in bars too often. <laughs> whereas Craig looked like he he lived in a bar. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to put it on record by the way, just in case somebody is watching who hasn't seen uh, that episode or show yet. Uh, so Craig is an Australian Australian bloke, as they call them. He was a last minute uh, replacement for an athlete who were supposed to have this big, tall, athletic basketball player, just to see how without any training, just to see how well how much does physicality uh, uh, make a difference and then the basketball player broke broke his foot a week ago uh, a week before the championship and luckily uh, my partner jeff phillips he he knew craig uh, who he trains uh, occasionally in self-defense like like com combatives but at the same time craig he, he he admits himself like he comes in rarely he he drinks a lot like he's you know just this <laughs> regular guy yeah. who trains occasionally like most you know human beings and and he without revealing too much but he definitely surprised all of us and i think danny what you said part of that is because he has that real life experience he's been in those situations so he has more common sense of what to do versus like we spoke about i mean jeff chan obviously you know he's he's very smart uh but but and he understands that this is you know this is media this is a show so so he's more tempted and that's definitely what happened <laughs> in season two he's he's more tempted to just show something fun so it doesn't mean he's he would always do that but at the same time i think there is a tendency you know like there's the saying like if if you have a hammer then everything looks to you like a nail uh, like i remember when i was doing purely aikido a terrible martial art for for effectiveness but i believe it was good <laughs> Uh, I I was much I mean Aikido promotes like de-escalation and this and that, but to avoid a fight. But then I was so keen on avoiding a fight because internally now I recognize I knew I would get the uh, crap beaten out of me, so I knew I would lose the fight. So I was like really 
uh, motivated to avoid a fight. But now when I learned fighting and I know that I, you know, like a regular dude is probably not going to be, I mean, you, you never know. There are surprises, but still I have an advantage over a regular dude. Now I, I like, I notice myself being like, should I kick this guy's ass? Like, like <laughs> there's more temptation to use your fists or legs or whatever, or choke person out. And like you, you're considering, should I deescalate or should I just kick this person's ass? So it's dangerous and it's dangerous because maybe he has friends and while you're choking him out, somebody's going to hit you with a bottle. So, so yeah. No, it was uh, mate. I, for for a last minute replacement, it was a stroke of genius. I think getting getting Craig into that show. Yeah, he's an absolute legend. I, I honestly, for me, he made season two just with his demeanor. He didn't give a didn't give a crap about anything. He just really in, he he just embraced it, didn't he? And he was just being himself. And I thought, you know, he didn't try and fake who he was at all. He just was like, yeah, I'm a regular dude. I'm just gonna sit here. I'm gonna drink beer. <laughs> Yeah, gonna, yeah. He actually, just and he involved. did. He did drink yeah, yeah. beer like in between. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with you. Like it was so special. I it was a risk. You know, we didn't know what was going to happen. It was like, okay, let's just scramble. And you know, my partner Jeff Phillips knew him, and he was like, yeah, he's a great guy. Let's 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 talk him into it. Uh, but I was like, I wasn't sure. Like, is this going to work out? Is he going to get his ass kicked? I mean, he's going up against like UFC fighters and and lifelong martial artists. Uh, but yeah, and and even what's cool as well is that we were speaking with Jeff Phillips about this the other day, where he was suggesting for Craig to create an Instagram profile because he doesn't have one. He's like barely on social media, and and he's like, yeah, people, a lot of people are gonna love you and they want to want to connect with you. And he's like, ah, no, no, <laughs> it's not like I don't want to get into that stuff. So he's like really authentic in that way, which I think is is brilliant. You know, that's that's real reality TV versus like these fake beefs and whatnot. Yeah, but it it just gave us a, a different perspective. Like Danny said, you know, you've got trained fighters because of the lifestyle attached to being a, an athlete and and being a martial artist. You you probably you, you're not out and about. You're not on the streets. You're not in bars. You're not going to put yourself in these situations as much. And it just shows that, like we said a minute ago, that that actually sort of you know street you know sort of street smarts and and awareness just it, it can take you potentially further than the actual skill set. I mean. That, that bar situation, again, not giving away details, but his very initial reaction, what he did in his initial reaction was the, the, the obvious thing to do. Yeah. And then what he did, you know, with the troublesome friend, how he reacted to that. Right. Again, just perfect scenario, the perfect reactions to that. And even yeah. with the observation task as well, you know, how he behaved in that compared to everybody else was was completely different, but brilliant. I loved it. Yeah, that, that was an interesting lesson for me as a, participant in season one where there's a scenario so i guess it's more likely people saw it so i i I can talk openly about it but there's a scenario where there's two people who have been in some sort of trouble and and i walk into that situation and my instinct was i have to save these people i have to protect them like i wanted to involve myself and later the 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 mo uh, the lesson was that you don't need to get involved like these people like if they're troublesome like you don't necessarily have to jump into that. And that's the best self-defense. And even uh, Nathan Levy says that in one of the episodes, like, don't be a hero. That's one of the best self-defense advice. And we still want to be the hero because, you know, we're men and we know how to fight. But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a big lesson. And, and Craig uh, was great at sharing that lesson. Yeah. yeah. And of course, it's, you know, it's, it's self-defense, isn't it? You know, that's the whole point. You're looking after yourself, not being a hero and, and everybody else around you. Yeah. And then, obviously, the the you know the, it was a little bit controversial elsewhere as well. So we talked about the the shank tank from from season one, and you know I think there was I think you guys had there was, uh, six of you. I think you had five rounds each. Am I right? Four or mm, five rounds each. I believe so. In, in yeah, I'm mixing up season one and season two. Season two, I believe, five rounds. Yeah. Yeah. So you know you had multiple occasions to survive that situation, and in in season one where you were a participant or a competitor, yeah. I think you made it out. Still with a few scratches, but but no no sort of death strikes. And obviously season two, I think there were a couple of different approaches. We obviously had Jordan, who people will know from YouTube uh, and his jujitsu channel, who took a, a very controversial, but very unusual approach to defending that situation, which was kind of smart, but not smart at the same time. But it was fascinating to watch. I mean, what was your reaction to that? 
Yeah, it was definitely shocking. Now, now one part is, which was unfortunate in the production of, of The Sense, that I actually, I said my luck is, is not that great. When I arrived to Sydney to film the show on the very first day, I got COVID and I spent most of the filming in locked in a room or well, closed off in a dark room and just texting everyone and calling everyone. So I wasn't there, unfortunately, to see it with my eyes. I only got to hear about it soon enough and I, I later saw it myself on footage. But I know that the other contestants and everyone around it, as soon as uh, Jordan pulled guard in, in the <laughs> knife fight, everyone was like, what? the heck is happening and, <laughs> and he didn't reveal that he's gonna do that he gave hints like oh yeah i have this plan but like nobody saw it coming because you know it's it's a joke like uh, generally like people make jokes about bgg players pulling guard in a knife fight and he just went for it and as you saw yourself and as as you as we all know now it's like it kind of worked out like would i suggest everyone to do that Probably not, especially because you know there's the danger of other people uh, being around. But let's say if it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, like obviously it, there is a chance it works. And and one thing which it, it was a big uh, discovery for me when I was moving personally from traditional martial arts to uh, combat sports in traditional martial arts usually was like this works and this doesn't work. Like this is the way to do it. This is the wrong way to do it. And when I moved to combat sports, all my coaches were saying like yeah, this could work, but probably this is low percentage, like like anything could work. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like you jump off a cage, back spinning kick, you know, and you see that on YouTube. And it's like, would you train that every day just, you know, for that small chance? Probably not, but it, it may work. And combat sports people knew that. And I think in cell defense that applies as well. It's not like never pull a guard in a knife fight. It's like, it can work, but you know, you're, risk, you're taking a lot of risks. But <laughs> Jordan proved, you know, there's no black and white in cell defense. Yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, I've got, I've got a four-year-old and he's going through a phase at the moment where he lays on his back and just kicks his legs. And it's, it's sure. even just getting past the, the, the frantic guard of a four-year-old is a little bit challenging. So I can see how it would work. And I think it's justification for it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah, it made sense. It kind of did make sense. I guess the, I guess the, the danger of that is he had the advantage of the time limit and, you know, essentially it being broken up after a certain amount of time. Whereas if, if you didn't have that, that safety net of the time limit, it's potentially a bad tactic, but yeah, who knows? I don't know. It, yeah. it only takes one kick to kick to the face, though, and it's yeah. over, isn't it? Those up kicks are horrible. If you can't caught with with, <laughs> yeah. with no with no face guard on, like yeah. And and uh, to Jordan's credit, like he also mentioned that, and I believe that that's on record in the in the edit that he was first of all he was pulling his kicks to some degree, uh, just because you know he was taking care of his attackers. That's turns out that's not a smart strategy to do in in the shank tank uh, of our show. And I think in season three, I'm going to have to warn the guys, the attackers, like, oh, my God, everyone's just going to try to uh, try to knock you out now because, like, <laughs> like it's it's clear, you know, it's like you, you have more chance of surviving even in the show and winning in the show if you just go all out, which I think is true to a big degree in reality as well. So Jordan was pulling his his kicks, at least initially. So that's that changed one thing. Like, I, I saw uh, even with my own eyes in an MMA Bellator show where a guy was on his back and he said, our big guy is coming in and he just kicks him in, in the chin. He just kind of gets rocked, walks in again and gets kicked again and knocks, gets knocked out. And that's a win. I'm sure that happened more than once. Mm -hmm. And so, so there's the chance. And even also to speaking specifically about uh, examples, uh, Jordan even kicked out the knife of one of the attackers, I believe in the, in the final guard pool. Yeah, he did. Yeah. It's like, you can't like, it's, it's, it's turns out it's not smart to say, never do this. It, Clearly, there's a logic to it, risky. But at the same time, everything is risky in a knife attack. So there it goes. And I think the other thing as well is Jordan obviously is very good at jiu-jitsu. So mm. he knows how to use his body in that way. Someone who's less <laughs> less trained in jiu-jitsu, like, like me, like a blue belt or a purple belt or something, you know, our, our up kicks and our understanding of, of our hip movement and <laughs> just doing that probably isn't going to have the same effect. True. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Very true. But mate, honestly, like I, I can't congratulate you enough on, on both season one and two. I think they're absolutely superb and ge genuine excitement when I saw it for the first time, when I came and speaking to Danny and obviously we talked a little bit or in length now about the shank tank, but um, even the very first scene going back to season one, 
where you had these guys sort of getting together and you're like, right, we're going to do a bit of live sparring. And they're like, yeah, great, love that. And they're right, should I head up to this bus? Okay, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing it in the field, are we? No, no, we're on the bus, okay. Are we go driving somewhere? No, no, we're, we're doing it on the bus. All oh, right, well, it won't be moving. Now it's moving and it's swerving. And just the, the chaos that that created was just for like an opening, like an opening like challenge was, was just brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was interesting to observe the difference also between season one and season two, uh, especially in production. But I think it's visible in the way the show's portrayed, and and some people already commented on it, the the, or the people who saw early previews. Uh, so in season one, the guys had no idea what they're getting mm. into. Like we had these this friendly connections, so I was I managed to talk them into it. Uh, they kind of did it almost like as a favor. And also, we just wanted to meet uh, meet together, hang out. You know, everything is paid for them. So they don't have that much to lose in a way, I guess. So everyone agreed. But they were like, they thought we had the challenge in season one where we just push each other out of a circle in, in the beach. And and the guys thought that that's... I actually think that that was the first challenge we did chronologically. We, I just put it later in the show because it's not as exciting. But then the guys thought, okay, so this is how it's going to go. We're just going to push each other around. There's going to be some small games. And then the next day, they, like the, the real first challenge happens. And we get into the bus and they're like, what the heck is happening? And then we keep showing him the next then the next thing and the next thing. And, and they were taking it. But at the same time, like the stress levels were huge. Besides Jeff Chan. Jeff, Jeff Chan was just having fun. <laughs> he was just like, oh, everyone's like, oh, this was so st- this challenge was so stressful and it's so exhausting. And Jeff Chan's like, yeah, this was the most fun challenge. I'm like, God oh, damn, it feels like he's wired differently. But then uh, in season two, we had guys who are a little bit, uh, part of the guys were a little bit more like Jeff Chan in mentality. They're like, bring it on. Also, they have seen season one. So they were expecting to be pushed to their limits. They were, they, they were expecting this to be hard. And also they knew some of the challenges already. So the element of unknown was removed. And the unknown is what creates stress because you're like, you don't know what's going to happen next. Like in season one, we had the zombie event planned. And I didn't want to reveal that to them because it's such a nice surprise. But the guys were already, some of the guys were reaching their limit. They're like, you're just going to throw us in with a bunch of kangaroos and, and make us fight them. <laughs> and I'm like, no, guys, this is going to be fun. It's like, I don't trust you. And it was like legit. It was like legit stress. And then they learn it's zombies. And then suddenly they they feel better. And then the next challenge is, again, very difficult. In season two, the guys knew what's coming. And so it was a bit diff- different atmosphere. And they actually wanted more. Uh, they even asked for the, the, the bouncer challenge uh, without saying much about it uh it wasn't even supposed to happen i'm very glad it did but we actually put it in because the guys were like we want to get pushed more we want more challenges we're like okay we wanted to protect you from the stress the first group experience but clearly things are different now so yeah this is uh the things changed yeah yeah no i I definitely noticed that a little bit i think uh, a couple of the contestants um i forget the, the, the guy's name the um the shaolin guy uh Ranton is his nickname and he usually goes yeah. by it. yeah uh, but I, I think he commented on the show a couple of times you know that he wanted to entertain and wanted to you know create a little bit of you know a little bit of a moment for the show and and obviously I think with obviously some of the events that were repeated you could tell there was thought out tactics going into that so so I thought that was quite interesting um True. and again this this comes back a little bit to to what you were saying about it trying to be like you know, sort of educational, where actually it has created some insights for for these already skilled martial artists to to think about how they might, you know, attack these situations. So, so it was interesting. It'd be it'd be interesting to see what you do with season three, um, how you change it up, and, and how you kind of re add that stress back in. Because I think that's a massive that plays a massive role in self defense and real life environments. I think that's needed. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if you can come up with any clever ways to uh, to catch these people off guard. It'd be really fascinating. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, it's it's always a, a learning process is what whatever you do, especially if you're, you know, smart enough, you have a head on your shoulders, then you realize I need to make sure that I learn from every single mistake and then make things better. And I think there there were quite a few improvements from season one to season two in, in both production and editing and everything. I think I think it elevated it, it's it's on a somewhat of a different level. But then still we're like, oh man, this could have been done done differently and and we didn't expect or see this happening and and one of the parts was because season one created so much stress in the in the contestants and we were like okay let's take it a bit easier and these guys and we're like turns out no now that people seen the show that's what they're expecting so in season three uh, you're right uh, also cell defense is 
is, is so adrenaline. Uh, there's so much adrenaline inherently in cell defense, and and the adrenaline does make you do things differently. It does uh, create a different environment, and so it's it's definitely one of our uh, priorities to make sure that, especially. I mean, it still happens. You're still stressed, even like if you go to an MMA fight or a, even a BJJ tournament. You know exactly more or less what's going to happen but then you're still stressed because you also you don't know if you're going to get knocked out if you're going to get uh, you know injured or there's still a lot of a lot of unknown and the same is in season two like you're going in there but you you know but you don't know so the stress was there but to have that stress where they're freaking out i think that that's that's a nice touch sure yeah <laughs> i think with um did you find that in season two you had i don't know you had more um i don't know like jujitsu guy and uh, MMA fighter and, you know, a, a high-level karate guy and whatever. But in the first season, you had, like, a, a different types of, uh, obviously, different martial arts that, were like, maybe are a little bit softer. Did you find, like, people's personalities is what paid the, played the role in what martial arts they'd done? You know, mm. how they reacted to stuff and how they were, depending on what martial art they'd done? In a way, that's a little bit hard to say, especially because, and it's kind of like, I, I love all the con contestants uh they're amazing and at the same time i almost regret that they're not pure like they're not purists uh pretty much none of them like like that's it's it's and the, the further we go in in history especially the, because of ufc and and you know the, the social media seeing like aikido guys like myself getting their asses kicked and then nobody does aikido anymore which is fair uh it's everyone admits it's like so common to understand that cross training is important and it's encouraged these days much more than it was in the past so it's rarer and harder to find purists now they're still around but but the youtuber guys or or you know the martial artists that we invite first of all we we do want them to have some social media following because then they're more camera friendly and uh, most likely and also you know they're going to bring some people to watch the show it's just some some logistics and then i also know these guys better i know what to expect from them because i've seen them on on social media so there's a lot going in, into that but that element is important to us uh and and these guys who do social media and and train make youtube videos there's it's a big chance they expanded already and tried this martial art and that martial art and that martial art even like rant on who was probably the most purist uh, in terms of like length of training combat sports he still trained for a year boxing and jiu-jitsu just recently although you know shaolin is very much his his base but he knew how to punch he knew how to strike in a boxing way he knew how to choke a person out and and that already played into it so so all of the guys essentially are cross-trained and in season three uh, i do want to try to find some purists like like even like a jujitsu purist like barely ever done any striking if ever like jordan he's 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 an mma champ like amateur mma champ like so damn it god damn it <laughs> you know it's like give me, give me a purist so i would i'm sure that lesson or that insight would come up if we would have purists like pure aikido guy pure karate guy pure shaolin guy pure you know, muay thai yeah. guy but now because everyone is so cross-trained i think it's difficult to see their main background playing into it as much as i think it's more you can see where their personalities perhaps why they were driven towards their initial original martial art initially but afterwards you know it's just i think it's more uh whatever's at the time in their mind and their personality which action to take yeah that's it i think i think jordan approached it in a really cool way where he did want to just use jujitsu just to prove a point but I think you're right I think in a stressful, a stressful situation and we've all experienced this with even sparring right but you revert to type you know yeah. you're gonna you're gonna just do what you do so it's hard I think to control that so I think finding a, a genuine purist I think would be really interesting on the next season you should get one of those you know fake martial artists like you see like where they're just <laughs> oh, bullshit that would be amazing there's this guy that's on Instagram I'll send you his link if you can get him on mate I honestly it would be the best thing ever because he's he's yeah, just, just, just full of shit. <laughs> I wish we would be able to pull off, pull it off. And but I'm they not wouldn't do it, would they? That's the thing. It's like it's not. It's it's not like it's not on our list. Like if if some It'd fake martial so arts good. guy would be like, I want to come over. In a way, like part of it, to be honest, is a little bit dangerous, even on production level, because like those guys are usually not You're setting them up to fail, aren't you? 
I mean, that's that's true, but but that's okay. You know, I like I put myself onto failure <laughs> on record too, and and that was that's fine. That's that's healthy, actually. I think. But the thing is, those guys they can be a bit crazy. Like, there's a reason why they yeah. believe their stuff. Like, they're probably egos inflated. Uh, you know, they're 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 not really. They don't have much common sense. You should get them in as a special guest. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, hey, do this single like a challenge <laughs> and just uh, get away. We don't want you. I mean, hopefully, some of them are nice. They could be, but a lot of them, they like if they fail. They like there's some videos on YouTube where a Chinese kung fu master gets his ass kicked in an mma uh, an mma fighter and the next video they make is like yeah that day i ate the wrong carrot or whatever and like what <laughs> you know it's like these guys probably like if they get at the ass kicked i mean they would they would have to sign a waiver obviously that they cannot uh make us not put up the show anymore but i think that those things that's what could be expected of them they could bring a lot of trouble with them or or like you know, yeah. I don't know, gouge an actual eye from a guy. It's that like, would be so you know. funny, though, mate, honestly. Because yeah. I don't think they'd even gouge an eye with, from what I see. Yeah, some of the guys, yeah. Just oh, yeah. oh, yeah, they wouldn't be It'd able be to do anything. But hopefully one day we'll be able to find the right way to do it. I think if you carry on, you'll, you'll get one. You'll get one. You'll be big enough at one point to, to lure them in. Yeah, yeah. But the hardest part is true. It, it's getting someone on board. And sale defense experts, too. Like, they have so much to lose because, you know, they're selling. They're probably getting you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for whatever they're teaching. And it's not like their stuff doesn't work. That's not what I'm implying. But if they come to the show and they don't look incredible, which is, you know, probably going to happen because self-defense is so unpredictable, that hurts their brand, that hurts their sales. And you're like, okay, well, and they see that a smart businessman, a smart self-defense instructor who's running a business, so little chances someone will agree, but hopefully one day we'll get there. Yeah, we're, we're working on it. Yeah, it's fascinating. We, we could literally talk all day about the shows, mate, because they're, they're so good. But tell us about where, I guess, the idea came from. Because, yep. yeah, I mean, you obviously said it yourself and Jeff. So, so yeah, talk us through that that inception of the show and how it all came together. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, the show initially, so I've been a YouTuber for a while now. Uh, and uh, a lot of people used to ask me, like, oh, are you not worried you're going to run out of ideas? That's... I was never worried about that, but, and that never really happened. But then you do start to feel a repetition sometimes. You're like, you feel like, okay, these videos, you know, I'm I'm getting bored of them or the audience is getting bored of them. So you're always constantly searching for new things. And sometimes some of the experiments you do on YouTube, they don't necessarily work. Like you think like, oh, this is going to be such a good video. It was, everyone's going to love it. And then you release the video and nobody cares. And I think I was in one of those frustrating moments where it's just like some of the videos didn't take off. And I was inspired at the time by Mr. Beast, the biggest YouTuber in the world right now. And he makes these massive, crazy videos, reinvests all of his money into each video, like millions of dollars, in case somebody doesn't know about him, although most people do now. Uh, But I was watching his uh, videos and also watching interviews with him. He has a pretty brilliant mind how he thinks about YouTube, because that's his whole life. And I thought, you know, what if I would take the Mr. Beast approach and I would think about I would brainstorm for ideas which are not limited by budget and not limited by by anything it's like even if I think this is impossible what's the most badass kick-ass idea that I could come up with and I sat down to write a list and the very first idea was oh get together these youtubers that everybody loves and everybody wants to see them together but there's so little chance for us to get together because we live in different parts of the world everyone's busy and so get these guys together that's already fascinating for our audiences but okay, so what do we do then? And a lot of people are like, hey, do you have Mortal Kombat, you know, UFC type of everybody fights each other? And I thought, I know some people are, they think that's cool or that would be cool. But I, I was not even anywhere interested in that because first of all, we have different ages, different sizes, different levels of experiences. It's like it would be pretty clear from the get-go who would win if we would go into a sanctioned MMA fight in a cage with specific rule sets. Like, you know, it's, 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 it's not that exciting as far as I can tell, unless you want to see another guy, somebody get his ass kicked, but then cell defense, that's very different because cell defense, first of all, there's no, uh, weight categories, weight massively matters, but there's no weight categories. Like you cannot walk in the street and, you know, a big guy comes up and you're like, Hey, don't attack me. I'm, I'm much smaller. Attack that guy. It's like, actually that's the opposite. That, that's what happens 
most of the cases, bigger guys, they look for smaller guys or weaker women to attack. So, so, so cell defense, there's no weight categories. Uh, there's also the cerebral aspect. Even if you're smaller, physically weaker, less experienced, you can make the right decision or the luck can play into it and you can still get ahead. So that was way more exciting. And also I always wanted to um, create my content with a sense of purpose. And we spoke about edutainment before. I realized, wow, this is like, this comes together on so many different levels. You get to see these guys together. Uh, it's in a way it's, it's unfair, but it's also fair because they're even like, no matter what size difference or experience levels they are, because self defense, you know, is equal to everyone. And, and then at the same time, it's going to be an educational experience for everyone. It's like just all things just came together. And I don't even remember the other things I wrote on that list, but I was like, oh, I really want to pull this off. And then it took a while until I saw an opportunity and eventually it became a reality. But, but that moment of looking for like not limiting yourself to anything and thinking what's the best ever thing I could create despite any limitation, regardless of any limitations, that's essentially how the idea came up. That's amazing, isn't it? How how well is how well did the first season do? Did it exceed your expectations? Um, so season one, in a way, yes and no. Like in terms of exceeding expectations, uh, it did. In like what I did enjoy, which was new for me, even after years of creating content on YouTube, is the first episode. Like a lot of people didn't understand that it's coming out. A lot of people didn't know what's coming. Like I made a crowdfunding uh, event uh, before season one. And I was like, this is so exciting. Like I knew how it was going to, to look like I knew I'm going to try to make it like a uh, Netflix level show and, you know, like very professional. And then there's these challenges that are going to be crazy and, and, and unique. Like I knew this is going to be so good. But then when I posted the crowdfunding event, a lot of people thought like, oh, this is going to be like the push each other out from the circle kind of weird thing. Like they, they didn't get it. So we didn't get, I didn't get that much money. And when I released the first episode, a lot of people didn't realize what's happening. A lot of people didn't click on it, but then I would release an episode every week. And then after the first week, after a bunch of people watched the first episode, they're like, whoa, this is like, this is cool. This is some, something new. This is exciting. And then I released the second episode and in like 12 or 10 hours, immediately there's like a hundred thousand people watch the video like usually it takes a while for videos to to take off right. but with every episode i would see like a hundred thousand people would just straight away watch it so i realized whoa actually people really love this but the issue is and this is kind of a little bit getting to the logistics of youtube right. uh i learned it only only recently that the thumbnails which is a huge massive part of uh youtube and titles too but thumbnails even more so the thumbnails for season one, I was not making the right ones. I was doing what it was popular at the day for, for all of us martial arts YouTubers. But we were doing these fo heavily photoshopped uh, kind of uh, we, we pretend, you know, you're punching me and I'm, I have this, you know, jaw open screaming, you know, and, and we thought we all thought it works. But then recently, especially me and Jesse Enkamp, we were YouTube released this feature where you can A-B test your, your thumbnails. Mm -hmm. And you could do that with some other tools before, but it wasn't as good as, as as this YouTube integrated system. And we both realized people, our audiences are way more to in, into realistic thumbnails, like just a screenshot from, which in the past you just wouldn't do it. It's just like, no, this is not going to work. And realize this works much better. And uh, once I once we realized that, I just a few months ago, I put a thumbnail for the Supercut there. Season one, it has like, all of the episodes together, it's like two and a half hours video. It was like, it had like 300,000 views, I think, which is still good. But then I changed the thumbnail and I put a thumbnail where just the guys are, were just standing there and looking into the distance. And I wrote, this guy does this martial art, this guy does this martial art. And immediately the views are just like, they're just going way up. And in like two months, I think we got extra 300,000 views. And uh, I think it has like 700,000 views now, the, the super cut. And I'm seeing like, okay, this has way more potential than initially it reached. So I think it's just a, in a long-winded answer yeah. uh, to answer your question. Initially, it kind of was, it was good. It was like, okay, this is cool. This is worth doing a second season, especially because by how hyped people were. But it wasn't like surpassing expectations and views. But now that I'm starting to realize how to pitch the show better to the audience and with a growing interest, it's going to be interesting because now we're talking before I released it publicly. So it's going to be interesting to see the difference between season one and season two. Yeah, no, YouTube's a funny old beast, mate. It's um, 
it's hard to get it right but but yeah i think ultimately the the content is 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 great and i think you did a really good job of the editing as well and the production of it i think it looks really good so now you've hopefully nailed the thumbnail mystery yeah the 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 issue was also i i never like there's some youtubers who love making thumbnails like i believe actually gsc income i keep referring to him but we we influence each other quite a bit uh we're like i guess rocky and apollo you know in the <laughs> rocky movie uh so he uh he he actually turns out did uh, graphic design in the past like he loves that stuff and i'm in a way i'm like in a, in a positive friendly way i'm like jealous of it because like he loves making thumbnails and those are like 60 70 percent of the success of a video uh, i mean the other percent is also very important but the thumbnail is so important and i hate making thumbnails i like i'm like i hate posing for thumbnails and so now it's a salvation to realize no actually people just want this legit screenshots you still have to put a lot of logic into it like which shot is going to be best like what arrow what, what red arrow you point where and what text you write next to it because that that crap works but uh, yeah i feel much more comfortable right now and, and excited yeah and then obviously season one you had a, a really unique insight where you were obviously the producer the editor you know you, you kind of it was your idea but you're also a competitor as well yeah so so from your like thinking back to that season one from your like perspective both as a spectator or a a creator and also as a competitor which which was your favorite scenario or challenge oh interesting question uh so in a way all of them were exciting like even fighting on the moving bus which is swirling and then stopping like breaking hard once in a while like you what's the next chance you're going to get to experience that and you're also fighting guys you you most i don't think i actually met every, any single of the guys some of the guys like uh seth and mike the they met before but most of us that's the first time we met and we're just going in there we, we saw each other for years we followed each other for years and now you're fighting on a moving bus you're like that that's special so it's you know it's hard it's hard to to top that but at the same time the challenge that's themselves it just pushed us both in physical and mental ways. And, and I enjoy challenges. I enjoy being pushed. So I think uh, all of them were special in a way, like even like running and hiding from the fake knife attackers. Like they don't have real knives, but the stress was so <laughs> real. I was freaking out so bad. Like my heart was pounding. I was like dreading for them to find me. So in a way that was special. And, and also the scenarios, uh, just walking in, you have no idea what's happening. A bunch of people are sitting around you and, you know, stuff starts to happen and you have to think on your feet and you have to adapt. Like even with MJ uh, sexually harassing me and, and me thinking she's a psycho lady wanting to kill me, take, you know, misinterpreting the situation. <laughs> that, that, was, that was very cool. I think like these highlights probably are the first ones that come to my mind. Yeah, and being a competitor, but also a, a, the producer as well. I mean, how much insight did you have to the challenges? Did you did you like you mentioned there that you didn't know what some of the finer details were? How much did you know as a competitor going into that? Yeah, that that's a controversial subject between viewers because a lot of people like they have these uh, conspiracy theories that I knew way more, and like like especially with the the Shank Tank uh, or oh, actually no, so Shank Tank I was the only one. Who had a, who got a single point, I believe, and that was like half luck, half skill. It's just like things fell into place. So lucky me. But uh, in in episode two, which is which is very frustrating for me, uh, just on a personal level, because I come from a traditional like keto background where I was, you know, this kind of like a hippie yogi type of person, very nonviolent, and and I moved on to doing combat sports very much on record and documenting my journey. And I have a lot of haters who don't want to see me succeed and a lot of people who still like they they see me as that guy oh sorry uh they see me as that guy and i that's frustrating for me because i'm like i did this and i I had mma fights i fought in the cage i trained with like conor mcgregor's coach i did all of these things and these people still think i'm a pussy you know so that's frustrating and then in episode two uh i did very well in the the circle drill where we close our eyes and you open your eyes and you suddenly have to respond to to whatever's happening in front of you like things just went smoothly for me and and a lot of people were like oh my god you knew everything that shows that you're a director producer and it's like this is not fair and i was like 
no, this is demoting all of my effort. And this was like my celebratory moment. I'm like, yes, I did great. My wife was there <laughs> seeing it. Like she was proud of me. I'm proud. And everyone's like, no, you suck because you're a director. So, so that was too bad. But to answer your question, I was doing my best uh, to be very fair and honest and to know as little as possible. So I knew some of the concepts because I wanted to approve them before. As a director, I, I had a feeling like this is going to be interesting on YouTube to watch or no. So for example, I knew that, okay, we're going to have five or six scenarios where we close our eyes, we open our eyes, and something is going to happen and you need to respond. I had no clue what's going to happen. So, so that made it fair in that way. Like I could somehow maybe mentally prepare for that because the other guys learned it only like 30 minutes before. But even then, I didn't know what's going to happen. Like, uh, I knew that we're going to fight in a bus. But then, you know, it's like, what, will I go fight and train in a bus <laughs> in, here in my country? It's, yeah, or scenarios. I had zero knowledge what's going to happen specifically in scenarios. I knew it was going to be scenarios. That's it. So I did my best to make it fair. Yeah. Yeah. And was, it, was there anything that, that really surprised you, whether it was the, the sort of outcome of a particular challenge or, or, or sort of the reaction of, of one of the contestants or anything? Yeah, that just really caught you off guard that you, you just thought, I did not think that was going to happen. And it just happened. I think in a way, there were a lot of surprises. Like in, in season one, when I when I was one of the contestants, the problem was we didn't see many of the each other's performances. We were just waiting there in the waiting room. So it was we, we had a hard time experiencing that although that does remind me of a funny moment where jeff chan and i unfortunately that didn't make it to record because no one was filming that but in the scenario with the sexual harassment the the boss lady wanting to you know ask for sexual favors for for our promotion or whatever uh jeff chan he was the first one to go in and he came out he didn't say that to us but he went to the bathroom he just he put some water on his face to look like he's sweaty and he comes in like gasping. He's like, like he's he's not saying anything, but we're like, oh my god, this is like this is gonna be so hard. Like def <laughs> guys are definitely attacking. And I come in, you know, all stressed. And after seeing Jeff, I'm like, when is this gonna happen? When is this gonna happen? And then I learn that you know no one attacks us. And then I'm I'm standing. Then I think I say that on record. It's like. Why was Jeff sweaty after a sexual harassment <laughs> That's scenario? That's really clever. That's really <laughs> clever from him, though. That's funny. So, so yeah, we had these moments. But uh, in, in terms of just editing and, and seeing the show and see who does what, like, there, there's always something that surprised. Uh, like, you, there's the best moments, I think, were when you were like, whoa, I never thought about this. And that was especially the icy Mike saying he needs to go to the bathroom to pee. And the sexual harassment scenario was like, <laughs> this is genius. And he came up on that, about that on the spot. It's like, whoa. So, so there were definitely a, a bunch of moments like that. You know, there, there were a lot of moments like, I, I guess I could expect a UFC fighter like Nathan Levy to kick ass. But it's like, holy crap, like, like that's, that ass kicking looks like Hollywood movies. <laughs> or, or, you know, Renton coming up with the... Like the awareness challenge where he just makes makes stuff up and he actually <laughs> scores pretty well. I'm like, gosh, like, you know, people come up with all sorts of ideas that you just you just never think about until you see someone else do it. So that's cool. I like that. Yeah, no, it was there. cool. And what you said about the um, the sort of uh, the, what Jeff did, I think, in season one, there was definitely a little bit of that psychological warfare in season two, I thought, as well. Oh yeah. You know, Jordan, yeah, Jordan on a couple of occasions did it for sure, but I think there was lots of that going on, and it seemed like the group were a little bit more competitive. They all kind of had the eye on the prize a bit more, I thought. Oh yeah, that's that's a hundred percent true, and and that like I mentioned that in season one, uh, the whole group was more stressed stressed about the event in events. The season two, I was way more stressed as a director. Because especially like on day four, uh, I came out of my COVID room just wearing a mask. I, I, I tested negative. So we decided, okay, I can walk around even like with my fuzzy brain. But, but I was starting to get into it. And that was the day where we revealed the scores. And it was just like suddenly the whole room just changed. And, and I could <laughs> feel the tension because I was like, I was like lighthearted about it. I was like, I was playing by season one rules because we were like in season one, we barely, everybody wanted to win the belt, but we barely cared about it, like, like really. Like, we didn't, like, well, Seth was very, like, very emotional about it because he's very competitive. But he wasn't, like, he, he wasn't, like, oh, my God, I'm going to, you know, go, uh, go out of my way to kick your guys' asses. We're, like, still very, uh, like, we had this camaraderie. Uh, in season two, there was the camaraderie. There was the friendliness. 
but we had some guys who were just dead on dead set on winning and i was like holy crap like these guys really want to win like like they are not here to play like they're they're friendly and everything but like there's a line where it's like no i'm here to win i'm like and as soon as we we announced the score and i was like yeah yeah, so this is the score and i'm like i feel like the room just changed you can cut the (laughs) the the tension with the knife and and we're walking from the first facility to the big facility it's like a 10 15 minute walk and i'm just trying to kind of ease up the guys like hey it's like lighten up guys it's just a show (laughs) or like obviously in a way like i shouldn't even do it and it's not like i said exactly that but i was like trying to lift the mood because i like with that level of stress you don't know what's going to happen like but like the guys may be much more aggressive towards the attackers towards each other's there's more chances of injury in a way that's great for the show to have that rivalry and to have that that real that real rivalry where the guys are really going against each other but uh for me as a director that was like oh i did not see this coming like this is so much harder to digest and and to kind of handle than just everyone having fun was that was there anyone who didn't get along no no actually everyone did get along uh it was interesting that jordan he actually thought that natan is serious and that was natan's attempt to 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 play the mind uh, worker the mind games to a way where you know he would feel like 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 Natan really wants to like you know kick Jordan's ass and 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 yeah so he so Natan all the time he was he knew that this is just kind of a face he's putting up uh, for for that um, elevation of stress in Jordan but Jordan even after on the last day uh, Jordan was I believe the last person I interviewed uh just by how like, I would interview people in between, but but Jordan was like the last last person on the very last day after everything is over, and I was telling like like I was telling him like, hey, actually, Nathan told me on record that he was just pretending, like he was just uh, playing mind games, like there's nothing actually personal. He likes you, and he's like, I don't know, I don't, I don't think that's true. I'm like, gosh, like so so, but they were still getting along together, like there was no real beef between them. But I think Jordan honestly thought Nathan dislikes him although that was not the case so i think that's the only thing i i think of everyone else is like we also pre-select guys we we want guys and this is what the part i enjoyed because in season one a lot of people in the comments said whoa this is like great reality tv where there's no fake beefs and and there's a sense of camaraderie like it's a very wholesome feeling like that's the specific word people use and i thought yeah that's kind of cool because i understand why reality shows go for like add this this douchebag who will destabilize everyone and he will create beefs and and it'll create you know sens- sensational sensationalism by content which which is gonna go viral but at the same time like i don't really want to go that way I, I want people to come out feeling that wholesome feeling at the end it's like why not we i want to be different i don't want to do the same thing everybody does and i think with season two we managed we had that wholesome feeling as well despite the, the mind games <laughs> I was thinking to myself though when you say it about that I was thinking if it was me I'd do like a like a big bro- brother scenario where they're all sleeping at night and I'd get them, get them like break into the house of a load of people tie them all up and, and just like <laughs> really that. fucking ruin them a little that's bit that's a great idea do you know what I mean like Home while invasion. they're not expecting it Home just being like yeah like so they're all in bed they're all chilling and then you get like four or five guys break in tie them up see if they can do anything <laughs> about it give them a few digs and then leave them <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 this, this is slightly different, but I remember, and please, future contestants, don't use this, but Ranton was uh, kind of mostly joking, but I think there was a hint of, can I do this? When we were <laughs> having like lunch before the, sh- the, the show was, uh, we filmed the show, he was telling about um, putting like laxatives in everybody's food because they're living together right <laughs> and i'm like that's a brilliant idea but please don't do this this is gonna ruin the show yeah. i don't want everyone you know having bad stomach during challenges but uh, but yeah and also with the challenges it was funny in season one when uh i see mike and seth they arrived together and they came into the facility and i'm like hey guys finally good to see you come in and i'm like showing them around and i'm like they're like all tens and they're like all these kind of like uh, worried about something and cautious. And I'm like, like what, what's wrong, guys? Like, are you not happy to be here or what's happening? And they're like, 
you're going to attack us. Like, you're going to have guys jump on us right now. I'm like, no, no, I promise. And they still didn't believe me for like 30 minutes. So I think people expect that. But at the same time, the challenge with that is that, you know, things could go so wrong mm, if, yeah. if there's this unpredictable, like nothing is set up. Uh, so there's cert certain line we can't go uh, yeah. too far after. Yeah. Yeah, mate. But in fairness, for me, it's it's all about the challenges in those scenarios. So I don't think you need that that sort of reality TV drama. I don't think you need it. So I think as good as it is. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's it, the, we just spoke about that off record. But uh, the further we go, the the harder it is to stand out. In a way, probably that was always true. But especially with how quick things are going, like they say, like there's millions of hours of YouTube being uploaded in a minute every day so it's like you know how do you stand out there and i think uh, having the sense of, of camaraderie wholesomeness in rivalry i think in a way that's unique like that that makes the show different to to so much which is out there and maybe that's not gonna tick the boxes for some douchebags who want you know these like beefs and 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 you know terrible seeing how terrible people do but but as far as I'm concerned, I think it's like, yeah, why not? Being different is not e <laughs> easy these days on social media. So why not do it? Yeah, one thing that um, you've not done yet, and it's not something we've talked about, but something that I'm curious about. And for me, it's a very big area of sort of uh, controversy with self-defense, but obviously it's female self-defense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this may be something that's on your radar, something that you've considered, but have you thought about having, you know, either an entirely female uh, competitor cast or a female in the group? Yeah. So it is definitely on my mind. Uh, it's been a question from the get go and especially from the audience. Like I didn't think that much, like season one was more or less an experiment, although it doesn't really look that way. I think it turned out really well. Uh, but, but originally it was like, let's, Put this together and let's see what happens. And it, again, as a producer, director, it's 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 a good strategy, I find, to first rely on people you have some uh, connection with, like especially to get people on board, especially, especially for season one when people didn't know what's, what they're getting involved into. Uh, I If like they trust me, they kind of know me, it's so much easier to, for them to say yes than if there's an unknown person we never met, we had no connection, and I asked them to do this. It's like probably few people, if anyone, would agree. And so on my radar, on the YouTube community, it's like primarily us guys getting our content suggested to each other, having some connections. And I was like, hey, these guys, people watch us. So it was natural to get that group. So women, I didn't even in a way consider women because these were the guys that were just closest to get uh, for me to get and most exciting to get. But then once I released season one, uh, a lot of people are like, hey, you should get a woman there. And I was like, huh, I wonder, you know, how that works. And interestingly, uh, Jeff Phillips, uh, my partner, who's more responsible for the challenges and, and the setup of them, because that's his uh, living, like he does challenges like this for his self-defense students constantly. And I pitched him like, okay, so do we get a female, like a lady for season two? And he made some good points that uh, if we get only a single woman, and I hate saying this, but I think, you know, it's it's true. It's like, essentially, it's like, on one on the one hand, whether this is controversial or not, it's like getting a female boxer to fight a male boxer. Like, we had this whole Olympic thing right now where it's like, it was such a big controversy already mm. when it's like, it wasn't even clear, like, what's what's happening. And, and you don't get female boxers fighting uh, male boxers or UFC fighters. It's, you know, there's, there's significant differences. Now, I also have to track back to, the, to my statement where I said self-defense is equal, which is true. And initially, I was tempted, like, maybe we get a woman. But at the same time, it's uh, the way Jeff Phillips expressed it. Uh, he said it's, it's a lose-lose situation for us because uh, the attackers, they may naturally want to go easier on the woman because, you know, it's a woman and... If, Maybe that's not fair. They should go as hard, but that can happen. And if that happens on the record, it doesn't look good, you know, because now the woman is potentially getting special treatment. But then she, if she shouldn't get special treatment and we tell the attackers, go as hard on the lady and they kick her ass, you know, and they destroy her. Uh, and then people are going to be like, oh, you're terrible. Like, what did you do this to a woman? <laughs> it's like, not that that would happen, but that there's that risk. So, so I thought, okay, maybe having a single female participant is not the best way to go because of how many unpredictable aspects there is. But uh, initially I was, people were like, hey, make an all-female season. 
and for whatever reason, initially I was like, I thought, I don't know that many female martial arts YouTubers because those were the first people I thought about. Uh, and I thought maybe people are not going to be interested to watch it as much. I was I was not sure. But then the more the further I went and the more I thought about it, I actually came to a point where I'm pretty set on season four because season three where I'm already putting things in place and I'm already like setting things up. Uh, but season four, which is still purely uh, hypothetical, uh, I'm thinking about all female because if we have only only women, they all have fair treatment. They're all equal to each other in that way. The attackers, they go at them on the same level of intensity. And initially, I don't, again, I'm not even sure myself why I wasn't sure so hyped about it. But then the more I thought about it, more hyped I became because first of all, it's different. Women are so much more exposed to self-defense scenarios, especially in close environment. You know, uh, attackers, bad guys, they usually choose a person they perceive as weaker. And unfortunately, you know, women tend to be s smaller uh, and, and easily more perceived as, as victims, as targets. So they get targeted more. So self-defense in a way is even bigger and more important to them. And the scenarios are different. So to have that educational aspect and to have that experiment, to have women go through a similar self-defense challenge, like it would be the same concept, but probably design the challenges would be more tuned to what's more relevant. Like, you know, we, we, we did that to men as well, like, you know, sexual harassment, for example. But there's certain scenarios which are like, you know, you, you go to a date and the guy actually has different intentions. Uh, even like put those scenarios, uh, there's so, so many things that could be done. So I'm pretty excited and I'm pretty set on making season four all female. Yeah, that would be really good because it will be completely different. Like you said, the challenges a woman faces compared to a man is is yeah. so different. It's unbelievable. Um, a girl recently was saying to me like she constantly feels like prey. <laughs> and she was just saying that she just, you know, it's a, uh, her out and I never thought about stuff like that, but her outlook's very different to like ours going to the shops or even going for, to, for food or going to the pub or anything. So it'd be yeah. so cool to see how you could deal with those situations and, and how they deal with those situations, putting them in, in those scenarios. Yeah, I agree. And I think um, for, for me, like female self-defense is it's a real tough one because you see it a lot and you, you want to be teaching females something to defend themselves with. But often the techniques that I see, I just, I think once you put a bit of, you know, strength in there, I'm not sure they're, they're that effective. And I worry yeah. that people are creating these, these, this false sense of security or confidence in some of their female students who mm. may therefore put themselves in a situation yeah, where otherwise they wouldn't. So I think actually creating scenarios where you get to battle test it for real. Um, I think going back to your, you know, your edutainment thing, the education yeah. component, I think it could be really powerful as well as entertaining, mate. So I, I look forward yeah. to that. I want to see Ronda Rousey in there, mate. <laughs> right? I want to see a judo throw in everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Again, uh, I'm glad to hear your excitement and, and I'm really excited as well. And the thing you mentioned about the self-defense techniques, they are very common on uh, YouTube. Like, like they grab you like this and you do this flashy, fancy move, which probably... For us, you know, doing combat sports, we, we know it's probably not going to work out. But then also that denies, and it's a flaw in self-defense in general, but again, even more so important for women who who will probably face a significantly bigger, stronger attacker. Uh, there's so much that goes until that moment, which we try to tackle and present in the show as well, where if you, again, there's the hammer problem. If you always teach women, like, if somebody attacks you that way, you do this, but it's like, wait. The fact that somebody is grabbing you or already has a hold of you means you failed like nine or ten things until then. You know, you you chose to wrong, you chose to go to the wrong location. You probably, you know, perhaps you wore the the wrong clothes. Like if you wear a skirt and you wear high heels, you're so much more likely to get attacked because the person knows that you're gonna have a harder time to, to fight back, to run away. So not, you know, I'm not saying that don't wear these clothes, but, you know, you, you choose where to wear these clothes at what time, where to go, where not to go, what to say, what not to say. And there, I'm a big fan of this book, uh, The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker. It's like, I think that's, for me, that's the holy grail of self-defense where nothing physical happens. It's, it's everything until the physical point. And I think that's, in my perspective, that's 90% of self-defense. And uh, he makes a lot of very good arguments, but one of them is that our politeness gets in the way. And again, I, I don't want to be mansplaining. Uh, I'm obviously not a fan of that, but just 
I have no choice but to speak about that as as, as a male. Uh, but uh, I think it's a fair point that women, they're they're taught usually men as well. We have some issues sometimes where like some men they're just too polite and people abuse that. But women especially they're taught like be a nice lady, be a lady, you know, act politely, like don't say no, etc. And then the, there's many examples, but one is. An elevator opens up and you see a guy standing. Let's imagine I'm a female there. Uh, same can happen to, to a guy, but I think even more so for, for a woman in this case. And you see a person in the elevator and it's just like giving you the bad vibes. You're like, you feel this person is, is like, I'm not sure about this guy. And then you our politeness, again, applies to both sexes, to be honest, but our politeness is like, ah, I cannot judge the, the book by its cover. Why am I judging this person? Why am I like being, you know, making, I'll make him feel bad if I don't step in. It's like, no, fuck that guy. You know, it's like, you don't have to care about his, how he feels like your safety comes first. And so uh, you have to get rid of that desire to be polite and you have to first look for a safety. And even that lesson to portray, like that's so much more important than if the guy grabs you like this, you do, you do A, B and C. It's like, no, if you feel there's there's a risk there, don't take it. Don't be polite. Again, applies to everyone, but I think uh, for females especially, and if we can portray that and show that in the uh, all-female USDC, I think that could be very powerful. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's really weird. Me and, me and my wife, we watch uh, SVU, Special Victims Unit. We're about 20 seasons in, and it's all about sexual predators mm. and stuff like that. And what's so funny, we were talking about it the other day, and... Uh, there, there was there was a scenario where a girl basically got into a situation where she went back to someone's house without the intention of sleeping with him or whatever and then she gets molested uh you know he gets raped and whatever else and um and me and my wife got into a discussion about it and she and i was i was just saying that if she had avoided going there in the first place and didn't put herself in that situation then all of this would have been avoided and then she was like no no you know it's, she should be able to do that and not get into that scenario and i was just a bit like coming back to your point of not putting yourself in that situation is probably the best self-defense yeah there, there's a couple of points here so one is uh, coming from me so one is i was talking to this uh, self-defense instructor and and there was i i was back in the day when i was like you know and i kiddo instructor I had female students and we we're discussing with that person together and he was addressing the women and saying like uh, in in a perfect world you should be able to walk naked through the whole street and no one could touch you or do anything to you like 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 that's you should have that right obviously well you know there's law and everything but but he made a good point it's like sometimes we're we're being blamed for or there are stories of of in this case women being blamed like oh she she asked for it it's like no like you know she wore the clothes which provoked it's like no it's like she has the right to wear anything and go anywhere she wants that's that's a fact but does that can that create uh, more danger? I think that is true, and that's something you, you do have to consider. And as a as a connected story to that, my wife, we were it was early stages when we met, and we did some traveling together. And we were in Dublin. She was helping me film this MMA event. Uh, Saturday night, we finished like at twelve uh, or like one a.m. So, and there were no for whatever reason in Dublin, no more taxis don't pick up anymore after 12 it's like that's crazy i don't know why that happened that way so we had to walk like for an hour through the city center towards uh our hotel and uh, it's dublin so you know people are partying everyone is drunk and my i call it you know spider senses they're like freaking out i'm like there's so many unpredictabilities there's so many dangers and she's having a good time she's in a good mood she's like flashing her phone and like singing or like like shouting out loud making jokes i'm like like dude, like, calm, calm down, like, 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 don't bring attention to yourself. Like, and she, she didn't back back then she didn't understand. She's like, why are you freaking out? Like, like, what, what's wrong with this? Like, this is all good. This is all safe. And then recently, maybe like, actually, well, fairly recently, like a year or two years ago, that was actually before season one of USDC, since we, we discussed about that during the season off record. But my wife in a, was in a situation where she was hanging out with friends 4 a.m., in the main party street, like Friday or Saturday night. And uh, that's already like, you know, again, we all have the right to do that. But at the same time, there's definitely more danger there. Like you have to consider that. And she was standing with a group of people and this guy comes up, comes next to them, like pretty big guy. 
and just out of nowhere without any signs whatsoever before elbow knocks out two of her uh, male friends just like in a split second like bam bam like he later we learned he did uh combat sports he knew what he was doing but that's still impressive like you know elbow one to one jaw to the other jaw they both drop like you know trees on the ground and uh, you know there's blood everywhere and luckily the guy doesn't punch women so my wife didn't experience any trouble but later uh, when we had a conversation about that that was and it was like three years after that dublin experience she was telling me like you know what you were right back then like you shouldn't attract <laughs> attention and you were right to tell me to be like kind of like no well, you know behave uh, in a smarter way and i was like oh finally you needed to see two guys getting knocked out in front of you to, <laughs> to make that conclusion like fine at least you know it finally happened but uh, you know so I'm, I'm with you danny i understand that you know, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's always harder. We, we tend to listen less to people who are close to us. It's, it's just our nature. Uh, and again, everyone has the right to do that. But so I understand your, your wife not wanting to limit herself. But I'm also happy, you know, when there's that transformation yeah. and realization, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think you've just got to be aware that there are predators out there. And being yeah. a female, being smaller and more vulnerable to that i think you just gotta not put yourself in those positions and it's not a sexist thing or it's not a you can't do what you want thing it's being realistic about situations and i think yeah. Yeah. if you don't put yourself in those situations then you're gonna yeah. be better off yeah and and i think it's true again for for everyone because like for me i'm i'm very conscious i grew up in the in a rough city where i constantly was was mugged and and targeted but i was also like kind of shy and timid so so i was making myself more into pot potential victims so i kind of know how that feels but the thing is that made me hyper alert to whatever is happening like even i live in a city which is i, I think it's very safe i don't think i even saw a single uh, uh fight uh, happen like fist fight happening in like i don't know three years that i'm living here so so the danger level is pretty short or small but it doesn't mean there's no danger but then still when i walk somewhere and i see a group of guys uh hanging out drinking walking towards me i'm always like okay turn out. I mean, even like you know and we spoke about that before i know how to fight i'm a pretty big guy there's less likely chances that i will get targeted but it's like why risk why take that risk and and there is a chance that i will be targeted and there's the chance that i won't be able to defend myself so so i apply that to myself and i'm hyper alert uh, hyper kind of playing it safe and then it only makes sense that you know whoever can be targeted as victims as potential victims as as targets and again unfortunately i think it's a fact that uh, women tend to be targeted uh, quite frequently it just makes sense to to play it smart i do it might as well everyone uh, should do it yeah no i completely agree and then speaking of self-defense as we have been but specifically your journey with martial arts and mm. more about aikido because yeah. it's uh you know it, we've alluded to it a couple of times but it's it's a martial art that previously was claimed to be effective in self-defense and maybe more recently we you know kind of maybe don't believe that such as such anymore so tell us about your journey like how did you find your way into aikido like what were the uh the early beliefs around aikido like and then when did you uh start maybe seeing uh seeing it from a different lens yeah so uh interestingly enough uh, aikido was my first well first of all it was my first martial art and interestingly enough i did go to train aikido for self-defense I just mentioned a moment ago that I was growing up in a rough city where my friends were constantly attacked and, and mugged. Uh, I was constantly under threat and danger. And so it was a very relevant question to me. And the unfortunate part is that as many Aikido schools definitely did, and I think there's still some that do, uh, it was it was presented presenting itself as a self-defense effective martial art. And um, Grant, I mean, there's a an aspect that my first Aikido instructor, he had a bunch of street fights. He was not, he's, he's like a tough guy, worked for security, but he also did karate before, like he was punching trees and whatnot. And again, karate is also not the most effective, but you know, there's old school karate, which I, I believe that's what he did. And then he moved into Aikido. And so I'm pretty sure he could take care of himself, but he didn't understand that, you know, he probably looking back at it now, he didn't consider 
that broader aspect himself, that his background was broader than the background he was teaching us because he was very traditional in the way he taught. And also I mentioned that before that in traditional martial arts, what I experienced very much, it's like there's the right way and there's the wrong way. And that was his school. It's like, no, it's like grab like this. If you grab like five degrees differently, it's like wrong. It's like, it's like, and then I would get attacked in the street, even when training Aikido and I would go blank because I'm like, Oh my God, the guy grabbed me here and I never trained this technique. I don't know what to do. And I punched <laughs> the guy and you know, ran away. And it's like, and we're barely taught to strike in, in Aikido. So it, it wasn't making sense. But the problem was that in the culture, and I'm not the only, so to speak, victim to that, uh, it's you're, you're blamed. So every time I got attacked, and it happened a number of times, I would go to my Aikido instructor and I would tell him, dude, I got attacked. I didn't know what to do. And in his response was like, you should train more. It's like, you're not training enough. Okay. You know, it's <laughs> your fault. It's like, and it's on the contrary, I, I had a lot of respect in that particular story. There's Tony Blauer, who's a, there's a spear cell defense system. I actually went through its uh, cell defense instructors course a while ago. I never met Tony personally, just had some contact with him, but Tony, the creator of spear, he, he tells a story, how he developed the, the system he was teaching some sort of like cell defense slash combat sports. And one of his students came to him and said he got, he, he came with a shiner and he got attacked in school. And Tony, as the instructor, was like, okay, tell me what happened. And he's like, he said, well, I was holding a bunch of books on, on, on one of my hands. And then the guy grabbed me and then I didn't know what to do because um, I'm grabbing these books. And, and the student says to Tony, based on the story, he says, sorry, instructor, I'm, I f coach, I failed you. And, the, and Tony was good enough in that regard. He said, no, no, actually I failed you because I did not teach you how to respond against the, when you're holding a bunch of books or holding something in one of your hands. And that class, that's what they did. You know, they, 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 everyone held something and they started training and I think that's how he moved to more kind of practical, realistic self-defense. So that's the contrary to my first decade on instructor. And then long story short, I did it for quite a few years. Uh, I, I kept blaming myself. Then eventually I thought maybe my instructor is not good enough. I still, because everyone was very adamant about Aikido really works. It was back before YouTube was, was a thing. And so, you know, I didn't see myself getting my ass kicked, you know, 10 years later <laughs> as an Aikido <laughs> guy. And uh, I then moved to a different country to train Aikido full time, lived in a, in a dojo for three years. And and the instructor also made claims that this is this works for cell defense. So I started having skepticisms about the the potent the full potential of Aikido. I thought maybe it's not that great, but it would still work. You know, my instructor he does martial arts fifty years. Clearly, he cannot be lying. Turns out, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> and I had to realize that the hard way after a lot of years. So, yeah. Was there anything specific that made you think, you know, enough's enough now? Was there, was there a moment or a point where you was like, you know what, this is, this is done? It, it was gradual, to be honest. Uh, there were moments, I remember one moment which made me feel really bad was when I was walking with a bunch of my students, just kind of having a night out. Uh, and it was late night, party day, party evening, uh, like Friday, Saturday. And this, this shirtless guy, like, pretty buff, a bit older, came and started threatening us. And I, because I think now as I look back, because I had no fighting skills and no fighting experience, uh, subconsciously I knew that. I, under, I I realized that. And I actually spoke to a bunch of Aikido guys, like like high ranking, like experienced. I realized that they all had that as well. Like internally, somewhere you know that you suck, unless you are super delusional. But then you convince yourself, no, no, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work. So it's all kind of on top of your internal realization and so that realization made me freak out and i didn't really know what to do and then one of my students eventually he stepped up and kind of threatened the guy back and he he backed off but then i saw in the eyes of my students everyone it was just like a couple of students like not major ones but it was painful enough because they saw i didn't know what to do like i sucked in that situation i was supposed to be the hero i was supposed to be you know the batman in that situation and i wasn't and for me i was like fuck you know that's that's terrible so it, I had moments like that, uh, like gradually piling up, just feeling lost and confused in those situations. And eventually I had the uh, Aikido versus MMA video where I filmed myself because I knew, again, by then I knew Aikido, okay, it's not that great. I thought it works only under certain conditions. 
like life threatening it's gonna click and that's what we were taught <laughs> and uh, i don't think that's true obviously now but uh, <laughs> i i wanted to prove that aikido doesn't work well against someone who's trained on rec on the record a, a nice mma guy gently kicked my ass that video went viral and and that wasn't like a huge wake-up call for me because i ex i expected that but I also saw the response from the Aikido community because I was like the third biggest Aikido channel in the world at the moment. Like I was, I was becoming the the Aikido guy worldwide. And then a lot of my viewers like, "Oh, you suck! You actually, your Aikido sucks. It's like it's your fault. You failed Aikido." And then the MMA guys, like, well, combat sports people, who I thought they're gonna like laugh at me, they were all like, "Oh my god." You, you finally you're like you're 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 honest and you're doing this and you're showing the truth and that shocked me because i i was taught in aikido that combat sports people they're like they're they're idiots and meatheads <laughs> and i realized well something is off here and then i i thought okay let's let's look into this more so i started exploring that whole dilemma between combat sports and aikido and self defense and i realized there's so many inconsistencies between what i was taught and what's reality and finally my aikido instructor he was starting. He was. Ju he he just got his organization approved by Japan, which was like a big thing, and I was like, I was like one of the top people in that organization, despite me being very young at uh, at the time. But then, so he 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 was. I think he was concerned about his his image, uh, and I was you know I was the guy who's questioning Aikido and who's getting his ass kicked, and he started like telling me in his manipulative ways. Long long story. He he was doing those things like many many gurus do uh he was he was like essentially his point was he's trying to say it in a way where he doesn't mean it but his point was stop making these videos or or quit the organization uh it was a bluff he he thought i'll never quit and i said you know what i have enough screw you and i just left the organization and then about a year later i, I try to like make my kiddo more functional teach my students like more realistic self-defense but I, in, eventually i realized you know what this is not working. I closed my school and just completely devoted myself to, to combat sports, self defense, and just content making. But uh, but finalized summarizing the answer was a gradual process. It's it's awful though, mate, isn't it? Because I think so many people share, as you say, so many people share similar stories. I've got a good friend. I won't go through the full story again because I've already done it to him once, and he <laughs> hates me for it. But I've got a friend who he hasn't trained for a while, but. You know, he's a very good martial artist now. But my first exposure to this guy was during an MMA show where uh, an MMA fighter from my gym was fighting this Kung Fu guy who developed this new system of Kung Fu. And long story short, this Kung Fu guy got knocked out badly within a matter of seconds. Uh, came back for a second fight on a similar show, uh, fought a different guy, got choked out unconscious within a matter of seconds. And this, this, this Kung Fu guy is now my friend. Uh, you know, he's a purple belt in jiu-jitsu. He's a good kickboxer now. And, and I've often had conversations with him about this because he's a clever guy as well. He's got a good professional career. He's not an idiot. And he just said, look, you know, when you don't know and you walk into a gym, if it's a good enough sales pitch, you know, and, and you're, you're ignorant to, to the reality of fighting a martial art, you, you buy into it. And I think the sad truth is, I think less so now, as you say, because of YouTube. Yeah. Um, and and the, the, the power of information. But I think certainly going back, you know, sort of 10, 15, 20 years, I think there were so many charlatans out there just selling these martial arts that just didn't work. I feel sorry for like the, the 40, 50 year old mum who thinks that it's going to save her one day or I think it's so dangerous. So it was um, on Taylor Pierman's story today. Did you see that? So he's in a taxi in America and she obviously she's dropping Taylor to ADCC. And she's saying that she does Aikido and she's on about <laughs> how she could like, or her coach can from a like middle finger control, control him all the way up to elbow and break his fingers and his arm and stuff. And, and Taylor's like taking the piss a little bit going, Oh yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Oh, I should try that on my next fight. Like sort of thing. But it just, it just made me laugh because obviously coming into this and what we was going to talk about today, I thought, God, there's so many people like that around around the world where they they really do buy in and believe that 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 is possible and it's and it's just not and it's just not you know it's it's very convenient i can see why that happens and i mean can in a way it happened to me as well because in, like i'm a more i can say myself a more balanced guy now and i i always was interested in like fighting and and um like 
kind of the warrior mythology and and that whole culture, which drew me to martial arts. But it, originally, I I wasn't like a violent guy. I didn't I I didn't feel drawn to violence. Like some guys, you know, like presumably Conor, Conor McGregor, he's like he he likes to punch faces and he got paid for it, and that's you know what made him so successful. You have fighters like that who just are who naturally love fighting. And now I enjoy fighting. You know, I enjoy sparring. Uh, I enjoy combat sports. But uh, especially back then, I didn't feel drawn to like boxing or, or wrestling because I was like, that was not my personality. Uh, but Aikido was like, hey, we welcome people like you and you will not have to punch anyone's face. You won't get your punch, uh, your face punched, but you will learn a very effective self-defense. Like, look at Steven Seagal, you know, like this and that. And, and the thing is, they have very, these, these schools, they have very elaborate because they've been doing this for years. And they've been, whether consciously and I think mostly subconsciously or unconsciously, they were tricking people and themselves to believing it. So there's so many, like every single argument has an answer. It's like like even the simple, you failed, it's your Aikido who, which failed. Like, like, you know, some Aikido guy gets attacked in any school and they come back and say, oh, my Aikido didn't work. It's like, like this instructor will say the same thing. It's like, no, no, your Aikido didn't work. Everyone else is fine. And, you know, you ostracize that person if they don't believe you. So so that that's a true story that happens. But then there's more complicated, like, oh, it, w- it will kick in whenever your life is in danger kind of thing. And uh, and so those elaborate schemes, it's that's the sales pitch that you mentioned, Paul, where like it's it's not that hard to buy in. Now, again, luckily, it's becoming harder. But my point is those martial arts attract a certain type of personality, certain type of people. Uh, who who maybe avoid violence and don't want to experience it, but it's like it's like you you know you you want to eat pizza but have no calories in it <laughs> kind of situation. <laughs> yeah. So 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 those people go there, they get their brains washed, but hopefully there's enough information now that they'll get exposed to that being false sooner than later. In the past, you could go your whole life without realizing it. Yeah, hundred percent. And. And then from there, what was your what was the next martial art or combat sport that you did? So you said you took a bit of time out, and then when you dipped your toe back in the water, what was that with? Mm. So since I mentioned that there, it was like a chain of events that pushed me towards making that transition. The one of those events was a BGJ guy just randomly coming into my keto dojo and asking me like, "Is there a BJJ gym around?" And I back it was still early days, like BJ was not as popular uh, then. And I didn't even know that there was one in in my in my city, and even that was like hard hard old school, hardcore old school guys sweaty, you know, in a in a garage type of situation. So I said, you know, I don't know. And then he's he became interested in Aikido. I taught him some Aikido. He started teaching me Jiu-Jitsu. and I was like, oh, this stuff works. I already started feeling more confident just by learning, you know, the basics with him. And we trained for like a half a year together. And then my Aikido instructor started to see danger in that because he started seeing, okay, I'm starting to change my <laughs> mind and become more curious about the, the flaws of Aikido. And so he, uh, in elaborate ways, he discouraged me from continuing doing BJJ, which I kind of regretted for a while after uh, afterwards for listening to him. But then, uh, so, so that was my first kind of combat sports experience, half a year training with a BJJ guy just on our free time. Uh, then when I fell out with my instructor, I was still running my dojo for about a year. I started going to the hardcore old school MMA gym locally and mainly training jujitsu, just continuing my jujitsu journey, sometimes doing this and that MMA uh, training. But then I'm a bit of an all or nothing guy. And I was already like 28, I think, or 29. And I felt like I'm getting older. And I did not want to waste my time. And I thought, I realized while, while I was running the dojo, that was a, a big project that was making me very busy, occupying a lot of my time. And I realized, well, if I'm going to train jiu-jitsu one, two times per week, and then one time MMA, it's going to take forever until I'll, I'm going to get anywhere. And that was one of my motivations to close the, the school. It was more about like just being honest. But that was also on my mind, like, oh, I can, if I close my school, I can completely devote myself to training. And then I found this, actually closed the dojo without having any plan initially. And then luckily enough, uh, about a week or two weeks after I announced the closing, I saw this program. It was used to, it was, it was used to call uh, Wim to Warrior. Now, now they changed their title. So it was a program where you train for six months 
uh, every single working day, uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, which it's a terrible idea. I, I hate it. I mean, it's it's good for some people who work regular jobs. I, I'm very bad at waking up early. But I, I signed up for that. I trained for six months in the States. I, I had some connections which helped me out. And then I had a cage fight. And uh, then those six months, I was training a little bit of everything. There was a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of kickboxing, a little bit of boxing, you know, the, the, the regular MMA approach to, you know, teaching everything at the same time. And, and then later it was like, I started to focus more like a year of kickboxing, a year of BJJ, a year of pure boxing. So I would just go here and there. How did you get on your cage fight? Ah, well, yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a controversial <laughs> story in a way. <laughs> so I, I can, I can say that this in a, in a positive way. So the, everyone said it was like the fight of the night and it was, it was like a pretty solid fight. Like we were banging each other, we were you know, banging, throwing shots at each other for like, the whole three rounds it was supposed to be two rounds but then if they decided to draw and we gave it all and then if it's a, it's a third if if you, it's a draw then you have a third round and you're like completely spent and you still have to fight each other and we were still throwing shots so kudos to the other guy as well so we were really both in there to to, to do our best and so it, the video is, is is on youtube everybody loved the fight a lot of people said i was supposed to win it was a hometown uh, victory because, you know, the, the local guy won. So who knows? But it was close enough where it's like, you know, they say never leave a fight to, to the judges. So I think he deserves the fight because he deserves the win because, you know, he, 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 was, he was purely training only that program. And I came in as, you know, I'm an Aikido black belt and I did this <laughs> and that before. And I'm like, I was like, I, I, I look athletic. And he was more like a regular guy. Again, talking about regular guys. So yeah, he, he deserves the win, but but it was very close. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to check that. I've not seen it. How did you feel like coming out of that fight? It sounds like although the decision didn't go your way, you, you definitely held your own and and felt good. You know, thinking back to those scenarios that you just talked about, where you just really felt incompetent in defending yourself. Now you've just gone what three rounds, you know, with a trained fighter coming out of that. How did you feel? Uh, again, my all or nothing nature kind of gets in the way sometimes. Sometimes it's <laughs> it's very it's a powerful tool, but it's like a you know a, a knife which cuts both ways. So yeah. so the bad part was because I focused very much on the loss, and I I didn't I didn't see the fight myself initially, and I was feeling really bad after the fight. Uh, I actually I learned that my all of my blood went to my stomach, and then I puked blood in the middle of the night. Uh, so it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty scary stuff, but then I just posted the video. I was like, screw everyone. I wanted to give the win to the audience, but I was like, ah, whatever, hate me. And then a lot of people are super supportive. They're like, oh, this fight is amazing. You did so well. And they saw the transformation from me being the Aikido guy who gets his ass kicked to me, like standing up in the fight, in the cage fight. Uh, so most people were impressed and very supportive, but personally I was like, no, I lost. So, so I was very motivated to make a comeback. And then the next thing I did, I actually met John Kavanaugh, who, who's most well known for, for being Conor McGregor's coach. And uh, we, we decided that I will come help him with his YouTube channel. And so I lived there in Dublin for a few months. That's one of the reasons why I was in Dublin. Uh, and I trained with his pro guys. Now, as I look back, I was not on the level of the pro guys. So I was always the underdog. I was always surviving there. I got exhausted. I, I burned myself out training too much, training on, on too high of a level. And then I, I had some injuries, so eventually I had to, to stop doing it. But but my initial response was, I was like, I wanted to 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 have that win. I wanted to prove even more that I, I can be a fighter. And now it's it's been already quite some years since then. But now I'm like I'm starting to realize, you know what? I am pretty good at organizing stuff, which other people, many other people, would have a hard time pulling off. And at the same time, there's other people who train their entire lives. Like, that's what they do. It's like, why would I worry about comparing myself to those people when I can excel at what I do and just do it as a hobby? So so that's my next mature step, finally, mm. especially after the recent injury. That, that made me think a lot. But like yeah. breaking my leg, uh, just for people who don't know. But uh, but yeah, that was that was kind of my, my first response was I need to prove more. Yeah, no, I can get that. I'm, I'm similar, I think, in many ways. But, mate, listen, we saw you on the uh, on the championships and you held your own very well, mate. So, obviously, those years of training have definitely, uh, you know, given you some ability, to say the least. So, uh, so I think you're in a good spot, mate, given everything else that you do. 
Yeah, thank you. Actually, I, I did forget to say so forget to say that that was that was the win probably I was looking for. Even like I didn't take the the first spot, but I uh, I took a pretty good spot without spoiling things, and uh, and I was like I was like pure happiness. Like other there's other guys like uh, the person who won second place like was devastated like oh my god. But it's like he even sent he even made this video where it's like the first place is happy, uh, the third place is happy. Second one is like miserable because you know they almost <laughs> got the win. So he was there, but me, I was like ecstatic. I was like yes, and I, I, I yeah, I think you know, it was it was good for me personally to to do well enough, and and confidence level, confidence wise, I do know, especially because eventually you run into guys on the training mat who's be, who've been training like you know jujitsu for a year or two years, uh, even more, and then. In, in, in some situations, you just trash the person or, you know, a big athletic guy comes to like even boxing and they've been training for half a year, a year. And, you know, just you just you just beat the not beat the crap out of him, but you have like you dominate the, the sparring. And, and these guys are training, you know, so so they're having experience. A regular guy that will uh, that you may face that attacks you, there's a big chance they haven't fought or haven't trained. And if you have an upper hand against someone who's trained to some level, that does bring you confidence because you know, like you know, I can handle these guys. There's no guarantees with anyone or anything, but I'll probably have a better time uh, fighting against a random dude. Yeah, absolutely. You, you touched on your injury there, Roka. So I, I did want to finish up the uh, the conversation, just checking in on that, really, mate, because that was a terrible injury, and you know, one that you've mentioned may kind of affect you moving forward. Um, not just with martial arts, but also just with day to day function as well. Tell us uh, very quickly what what occurred with the injury, and then just how you're getting on with that at the moment. Yeah. So uh, the story was that it was an open mat. A guy decided to pull an illegal move, which was a scissor takedown, I believe. Oh no way! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like that's uh, that was great. <laughs> I didn't know it's happening. I didn't see it coming because we were close, and I just felt like this huge pressure going on my leg, and just like pop there was the sound for the entire gym like everyone heard it but most people didn't realize that was my bone i didn't even realize that was my bone i thought my just knee ligament or something popped uh terrible pain went straight to the hospital uh learned that my sh shin bone broke and initially i was like ah you know it's gonna be fine they'll just fix it up but then uh, it turns out it was an intraarticular fracture uh which means it goes all the way to your joint which initially that's the moment when I, I was like pretty upset because uh, if it depends on the surgery, like how well they, because then your, your knee uh, joint is affected. And if they don't line up it perfectly the way it was before, that means you're going to have uh, osteoarthrosis, I believe is, is the term, which essentially means you're going to lose all your fluids from your knee eventually. And your bone is going to grind into bone and you're going to have terrible pain you know, for the rest of your life. And it's, it's, it's hard to, to do anything about it, apparently. Osteoarthritis, I think. Yeah. And I was like, damn it. Like, like, like I'm okay with a temporary injury. I don't want to be injured for the rest of my life. So, so that was, that was something I needed to digest. And I'm sitting there, you know, alone in the hostel, can't move, can't do anything. And I, I need to just, you know, I'm just there with my thoughts about my future and life decisions. Uh, so the surgery was pretty hardcore. They put two metal plates and 12 screws. It looks pretty badass on the x-ray, which is apparently it's like a pretty complicated surgery. And those metal plates and screws, the plan is they stay for the rest of my life. Like I can feel them there. They're pretty awesome. They're like these bumps. I, I touch them once in a while. <laughs> I guess I'm <laughs> freaky like that. Whatever you're into, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, and my wife likes the scars because they're, they're pretty gnarly two scars and she's like, I actually like them. I'm like, ah, good. Then I don't worry about it. <laughs> so now in terms of recovery, uh, I'm getting much better. It's been almost three months now and I was investing a lot into recovery like uh, I take like a bunch of supplements, everything that's possible to help me with healing. I, I shine the infrared light on, on the injury, uh, you know, do the exercises. So one of the doctors who's consulting me looked at the x-ray and he's like, oh, that was like fast. You, you like healed way faster than normally. So I was happy about that. And finally, I'm starting to like put some weight on the leg, losing the crutches gradually. So hopefully... The knee is fixed in a way where I won't have uh, any permanent damage, but it did affect my mindset. Obviously, I did have to think about it. And already prior to getting the injury, I was considering 
I was starting to consider like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older. I, I had COVID like uh, during the championship and, and COVID is not so directly related to like an injury, but still like I, I got sick and then I got other injuries, uh, like a pinched nerve and just like things just didn't line up as well. Like they, they prevented me from training. You know, I could be hardcore and be like, I will beat this and I will still train. But it's, but I started thinking like, like, like training sure you know doing martial arts sure as a hobby but i was always very into it like even if it was technically a hobby i was like i was there to 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 get the better out of uh, against the other guys like I, I wanted to be better i was like i wanted to excel so i would i would spend a significant amount of time investing myself into martial arts where recently i started thinking like you know i, I have a limited amount of energy per day i have a limited amount of 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 time per day where i invest it it's 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 a choice that i need to make and uh, and this is one of my recent uh thought moments that especially with usdc having uh, quite quite some potential and being something special i'm starting to see that it probably will make sense to invest myself more into doing this unique thing instead of trying to prove something to someone on the mat somewhere and you know risk my 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 well-being and then again I love martial arts. I, I still encourage everyone to train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, everything. I was just unfortunate in that situation. But it was an interesting moment that I was already considering to become less invested as a hardcore martial artist and more invested into my projects. And I think that injury just made me push forward towards that even more. That's wild, isn't it? I can't believe someone done that to you on an open mat. That's his, yeah. that's his yeah. Apparently, man. the guy didn't know what he was doing, but then, I don't know. Yeah, who knows? Was he, what was he, a white belt or... Uh, I think it feels like a white belt move. Yeah, no, he's watched on YouTube and just gone bang. Yeah, I, I think like he was like we were going toe to toe, and he even had an advantage on me. And I'm like, you know, blue belt, you know, with some years of of experience. So, so he's probably around the blue belt level. I don't know if he has a blue belt because I think he's a nogi guy, but but he's a guy, and he's not a bad guy. Like I don't think he was like he wanted to hurt me, uh, but he's just you know this kind of spaced out not really there kind of dude and he's also very much all or nothing in terms of physicality it's like i know some people just don't train with him which is smart that's my lesson i'm not going to train with uh, questionable guys anymore where, where at that moment i was like yeah this is a challenge i should take this challenge <laughs> and and that was literally what i thought uh yeah. or getting my leg broken i'm like no i don't need these stupid challenges i can challenge myself in smarter ways with smarter people uh, but so I think, uh, he was just, he, yeah, he just didn't know better, any better. And he just did something stupid. And I don't even understand. I don't even think he honestly realizes, uh, that well, what happened. Yeah. So it's just one of those, it's just unfortunate, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it sucks, man. I don't yeah. know what to say. It is what it is. I, I'm glad that again, again, I think it's with age and maturity, uh, and just having a lot of crap happened to you uh that i i feel like i'm and i think some people thought i'm just like full of crap uh, when i was sit, writing that because i was in the hospital you know people are like oh what happened and i was writing people back and I, I i honestly felt like there were some moments when i had to fight my inner demons but i think i soon enough soon enough i was like you know what whether i worry about this or not nothing is going to change if i worry about this i'm just going to feel worse and has will have no positive consequences. I might as well just do the best I can with this. So it was like really, I feel like it was really authentic, like my mindset. And I would text that to some people, and I think some of them thought I'm full of crap. Like, ah, oh, you're just saying that. Everybody would say that. But like, honestly, that's that's how I felt. And and many people are like, oh my God, you're like walking with your crutches for like two months now, and and this must have been so hard to you. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I just accepted it and I just live on and I just do the best I can with it. And it's not a huge deal. As long as you know, I still have two legs, I can still walk. My wife had to, you know, take the heavy hit by needing to cook for me for like <laughs> two and a half months and, and walk the dog by herself. And so, you know, she, she was the one who suffered. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just, you know, hanging out with my crutches. So, so yeah. Yeah. It's a great attitude, mate. And we wish you all the best obviously with your recovery and uh, yeah, long-term knee health as well. Thank you. So, mate, we're, we're about done in regard to what we want to talk to you about. So we've really enjoyed this conversation. It was great just chatting about the show and hearing about your journey and everything else. But take a, take a moment just to tell our audience, um, I guess, where to find your content, like anything else that you've got going on. And, yeah, just plug away, my friend. 
Yeah, sure. So Ultimate Cell Defense Championship is, is the main big thing. Uh, we created a dedicated website, which is usdchampionship.com. Unfortunately, USDC is a cryptocurrency, and they already have the, the domain taken. <laughs> so we're fighting against who is known better, Ultimate Cell Defense Championship or the USDC currency. So we're going to win over. <laughs> but right now, it's usdchampionship.com, or just type, people can type in Ultimate Cell Defense Championship either on Google, and they'll find the website, and then they'll find all the episodes, or on YouTube. And also, there is my YouTube channel called Martial Arts Journey, where the Ultimate Self Defense Championship is, but also have other types of content about my journey. You can literally see all of my uh, transitions because, like, videos. I started off as a pure Aikido tutorial channel, and then I became the guy who's questioning Aikido. Then there's a video where I just closed my dojo and I just share my thoughts out loud about it. So all of that is documented. If someone is into it, they can watch the Martial Arts Journey channel. But so yeah, those two. Awesome, but yeah, we I can't encourage you enough to go and watch this yeah. this show. It's it's that's honestly superb. So uh, so yeah, we'll continue to plug it for you because I think it's great. I really enjoyed season one, really enjoyed season two, and look forward a lot to season three and four and any you do in the future. But thank you again for for coming on and chatting to us, and keep up the good work with what you're doing because it's yeah again superb. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys as well. Uh, appreciate you having me here, and uh, also thank you for being so encouraging. So yeah. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you, buddy.